Let's turn in our Bibles tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 18. And remember from last week, chapter 17, David has defeated Goliath, and he's later brought to Saul and introduced as David, son of Jesse, son of Saul's a servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Verse 1, and it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and gave it to David, and his garments even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. So he's, he's knit to his soul, he's woven, chained, whatever you want to say, Prince Jonathan. You know, if anything, he should probably feel threatened by David, because Saul anointed David, I'm sorry, Samuel anointed David uh, to the throne, and uh, Jonathan is the next in line, of, 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 you know, as Saul's son. And, uh, and, and Jonathan gives David his personal weapons. He, he recognizes him as the military hero. And uh, what does Jonathan show? He, he really is showing a sensitivity to the will of God here. He's showing a submission to the will of God. And uh, he's really honoring God's anointed. And uh, there's no homosexual relationship here, as some would like to infer as some would think, just because it says their souls were knit together. Here's two very brave men, similar in courage. Uh, David has sl slain Goliath. Uh, remember, just back in chapter 4, Jonathan had climbed up. Remember, he climbed up to that small acreage uh, of land to the Philistines and conquered them. So they both possess a, a, a courage, uh, also a humility, and a concern for their own people. Verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that would be Goliath, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. He eyed David with suspicion, with jealousy, is what this infers here, because the women are, are singing a song that, that praises David in his victories and reveals Saul's pride. It reveals his insecurity. And uh, Saul really resents David's success. And then David's going to work for him. He works for a, now a jealous boss. But fortunately, Jonathan doesn't share his dad, Saul's, jealousy. Sadly, uh, weak, insecure leaders can often surround themselves with weak, insecure subordinates and then result, resent any successes they may have. And Saul is one of those people. Saul is proud, but he's insecure. And, and, and he, he overreacts to David, and he eyes David, and he's watching him now. His eyes are on him. He's watching suspiciously. And if we do something good, we can expect some to envy us. We can expect jealousy to come from others. And it's one of God's ways to keep us from getting puffed up and prideful. We need God's wisdom, especially in difficult situations. And certainly this is going to be a difficult situation for, for David. In verse 10, and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand. In other words, he's playing on the instrument with his hand, and as, it, as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, means he threw it, 
For he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Now, chapter 16 says that David played a harp and played with his hand. And so he's playing, he's playing music for Saul here. And uh, the commentators feel that prophesied here is probably the wrong translation. Might have been better interpreted uh, the wild ravings of Saul here. But he, he, he tries to kill David with a spear. David's playing music with him. Remember, you soothed him once before. And uh, David's a warrior. He's a soldier. Uh, he doesn't strike back at Saul. He could have in self-defense, but he's leaving it, leaving it to the Lord not only to defend him, but also to protect him. In verse 12, And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore, Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So David's transferred from the palace out to the army says that God's with David, and, and David is getting more popular amongst the people now. You know, if the Lord determines that he's going to promote someone, it doesn't matter what others think. It doesn't matter what others say. It doesn't matter what they do might do against him. God will find a way. And uh, it says that he went out and came in. That means he was going out and leading military campaigns, then coming back afterwards. And we're finding that David is a spirit-led man, and Saul is afraid of him. Verse 17, And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Mirab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So Saul is planning some danger in David's life. He's planning to have him killed by the Philistines. Now, later on, we, would, we will run into David and Uriah, who had a wife named Bathsheba. Remember that story? And remember, he saw her when she was bathing. Is that why she's called Bathsheba? I don't know. But uh, sadly, David's going to follow Saul's example in this instance of, of uh, sending a man to his death. Uh, because of uh, his own insecurity or because of something he wanted in David's case. Uh, verse 18, and David said unto Saul, Who am I, and what is my life or my father's family in, in, in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the Maholothite, to wife. And Michael, Saul's, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore, Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. In other words, in one of the two daughters. So he's he's... We see here the reason for the marriage now. It's a snare. It's a trap. Saul's jealous of David. And uh, under the pretense of doing a favor, he's uh, seeking uh, David's destruction. And he says in verse 21, my, my son-in-law in the one of the twain, the, the first marriage contract was broken by Saul when Saul gave Mirab to Adriel. Remember back verse 19, but it came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the, the uh, Maholothite, to wife. So marry either or both. Either way, she's, he's still going to be Saul's son-in-law. And at this time in history, and at this time for David, this is a dangerous place to be. Verse 22, and Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke these words in the ears of David, and David said, uh, uh, Seemeth it 
to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and, and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins and gave them in full tale of the king that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. So David, in order to marry Michael, had to gather a hundred foreskins from the Philistines. They wouldn't give those up willingly, okay? Uh, it, but it would provide proof of their death. But did Saul's real motive here? There's no way David's going to be able to carry this out. They'll kill him. So David takes and uh, he doubles the, the dowry here and killed 200 Philistines. And he marries Michael. And Saul's trap fails, and it backfires on him. Verse 28. And Saul knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. So what it's saying is that David's popularity is growing here. Uh, God is blessing him, and it's shown that God is blessing him uh, in, in not only his conduct, but the fact that people see this, and his popularity is grows, growing, and that makes Saul fear David even more. Saul's thinking, hey, things aren't going the way I planned it. Those Philistines should have taken him out. And Saul is starting to recognize that the Lord is with David. And he's recognizing that his daughter actually loves David. And this snare that he thought he was putting into David's life is simply not working. So Saul's fear of David grew. And his fear brought more of an opposing attitude, some anger, some jealousy. And there's no longer a peace between them, if there was. <laughs> And uh, we know that if differences aren't reconciled, in, even in our lives today, the distance can grow between people. Uh, in Hebrews, I'll read you a couple of verses out of Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15. It exhorts us to follow peace with all and holiness, without which no man may see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So verse 29 here says that Saul became David's enemy continually. They stayed enemies. There is no peace between them at all now. Uh, the, the Philistines are back. They're looking for revenge from uh, on David for Goliath, for the defeats that they've seen. And David having recently killed 200 of them, not on his own, but with his men. Uh, they uh, heard of David's marriage. Now, one of the things about Jewish law that's kind of nice, a newly married man was exempt from war for the first year. And uh, the Philistines would look at that, and they, knowing the Jewish law, would say, well, if David's out of the picture for the year, then he won't be involved in any wars, so we can invade now. It's a good time to invade. And isn't that like the enemy to look for weak spots? Because we have weak spots. We have weak times. And we need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. When we do that, we never run out of strength. Um, would you turn to Psalm 18? I want to read Psalm 18. It's uh, <clears throat> I didn't do handouts tonight. Psalm 18. I'm going to read uh, the first six verses. It's a Psalm of David, servant of the Lord, who spoke unto the Lord the, uh, the words the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of Saul. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, in my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. 
so shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried upon, unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. So David is acknowledging, you know, he was in trouble. He was in trouble with his father-in-law, and the Lord delivered him out of it. So let's take a look at uh, chapter 19 now as we see David thinking it might be wise to run away from Saul at this point. Verse 1. And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. Okay, here's the king putting a hit out on his son-in-law. Saul's plotting Dave's mur David's murder. He, he's getting help. He's looking for help from Jonathan, who says that his soul's knit to David. It's probably not likely to come from him, but many of his servants. And wants someone who is loved and trusted. Why isn't he trusted anymore? Why isn't he loved anymore? It's because of jealousy. It's because of envy. But Jonathan won't go along with it because he's a man, of, a young man of integrity. When you see or hear something wrong and everyone around you thinks it's a good idea and you know it's wrong, should we do it just because everybody else says it's the right thing to do? No, we, we have the word of God. We have God's Holy Spirit in us to tell us right from wrong. He, I think he puts that in little kids even. Verse 2, the reason I say that is I used to watch over the toddler room at Finger Lakes, the two-year-olds, and uh, when, some, when someone, one of the little ones wanted to uh, hit somebody with a truck or whatever the case may be, they would look over their shoulder first to make sure nobody was looking. They knew right from wrong, even, even when they were little. <laughs> verse 19, let's see, chapter 19, verse 2, but... Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeks to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee. And what I see that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spoke good of David to Saul, his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he's not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee word very good. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and did rejoice. Wherefore, then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? So here is Jonathan standing before his dad. He's in the field, but he's standing before his dad defending David because David's innocent. He's protecting the innocent. And Jonathan did a few things here. He, he, he warned David, which is disobeying his own father's orders. And he, he confronts his father and warns him of the sin that his father is in. And, you know, we're all under authority of something, whether it's in the home or the church or the government or the laws of our land. We're never excused from sin just because someone in authority told us to sin. We have to obey the Lord. Verse 6 says, And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So Saul and David reconciled once again, temporarily. So we see Saul vowing to the Lord, and we'll find out later he'll break it. James 5.12 says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven nor by earth, nor by any oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Says, you know, we don't need to swear things. You just need to speak the truth. And one of the things I hear people often say, trust me. We shouldn't have to say that. The words that come out of our mouth should be truth. So we don't have to ask people to trust us. Oh, yeah, I understand that one. This is how it was. Trust me. Well, I don't like that phrase myself. But don't swear. 
we shouldn't be swearing. He said, you don't have to swear on anything. People, in that time, people would swear on the temple. They'd swear on the altar. They'd swear on this and that. We just need to convince people that we're telling the truth by being truthful all the time. And he says here, let your words always be true. Let yes mean yes, and yet no mean no. Let no mean no. So we don't need to defend ourselves. People would look at us and say, well, if they said it, that means they believe it. And it's got to be true or else they've sp spoken wrongly because they don't, they don't lie. Story goes that a, a mother had a birthday party and the, uh, the gifts are brought to her one by one. And the smallest girl comes, carries an empty tray and puts it on the floor and then steps on it and says, here, mommy, I give you me. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? <laughs> That's what we should be doing with the Lord, just saying, Lord, I give you me for what for what you, we, I am, you know. And you think about it, we are his gift. We are Christ's prize. We are his, this is what, we are the ones he died for. So we are his gift, his prize. His prize. So Jonathan here was wise. He, he had a, a willing obedience to the Lord. And he also had a, a willingness to lovingly, lovingly confront his dad for the sin that he was in. He, he, he was used by the Lord to uh, reconcile or bring get together Saul and David again. In verse 8 it says, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they, and they fled from him. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, and he, as he sat in his house, with his javelin in his hand. Now, do we know anything from Saul and David's past that this might be a, a treacherous moment? And David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. So you suspect that David, as he's playing, he's got his eye on Saul, Deja vu, I've been here before. <laughs> I'm going to watch his hand closely. And as soon as it goes up, I'm out of here. So Saul tries to kill David again, and David runs from him. David's successful. Saul gets angry again. Still jealous of David, still envious of who David is. Proverbs 14.30 says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. As Jesus stood before Pilate, Matthew 27, 18 says, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. That's why they had delivered Jesus. It was Pilate knew that. Stephen, just before he was martyred, spoke in Acts 7, 9 and said, And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. So here we see the Holy Spirit departed from Saul again. And he's easy target now for a a distressing spirit to come upon him. Back in chapter 16, and verse 14, it says, But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So David escapes once again, and he escapes from the palace of Saul, never to return at this point in time. From here on, David's a fugitive from Saul. Verse 11, Saul also sent messages, messengers, unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster, the head of the bed, and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of gold's hair for the bolster, for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, why hast thou deceived me? Like he doesn't know. Why did you save your husband from me killing him? Is what he's saying. And sent away my enemy that he has escaped. And Michael answered Saul. Answered Saul. He said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? Michael helps David escape Saul. And Saul's after him again, pursuing him. Why? To murder him. 
because he broke that vow that he took back in verse 6. But at this point in time, at least his family's not going to help him kill David. And uh, the, uh, the image here, uh, the commentator said, is a teraphim, a household idol of fertility that's uh, used for good luck, meant to be an aid in the worship of God, uh, the true God, um, and uh, not, a, not a violation of the first commandment, but the second in Exodus uh, chapter 20. Verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So Michael, she's faithful to her husband David and helps him escape and lies to her father saying, Well, David would have killed me if I didn't help him. So she's lying. And Saul calls David an enemy when he could have been the best friend Saul ever had. Verse 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he as Samuel went and dwelt in Naioth. So David does the right thing. He's in a difficult situation, a confusing situation. Visits Samuel who's at Ramah now and spends some time with him. He's a godly man. He's seeking godly counsel. In verse 19, he says, And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David's at Naoth in, in, in Ramah, and Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as anointed over them, or appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again, the third time, and they prophesied also. So he's sending messengers to capture David, and apparently they're touched by God's Holy Spirit because they're prophesying in the in the presence of Samuel and the other prophets. Uh, the prophet or the commentator John Gill says about these verses is that they're singing hymns and songs of praise to God under the inspiration and influence of the Spirit of God. So prophesying there are two types of prophesying one is future speaking let's prophesy the future the other is truth speaking in other words speaking forth the truth of god's word and uh the men uh sent by saul are touched by the holy spirit and they 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 speak the truth of god and what as john gill said they're they're singing hymns but uh they they do come back home but they return empty-handed not having David with them. And here, let's read to the end of the chapter from verse 22. Then he went also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Seco. And he asks and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Ramoth, or I'm sorry, Nioth in Ramah. And he went thither to Nioth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Nioth in Ramah. <clears throat> and he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and laid down naked all that night or all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, as Saul also among the prophets. So Saul uh, pursues David himself now, then prophesies in front of Samuel and the prophets. Could um, very well have been Samuel's students. Um why Samuel here? It seems that the Lord allows David to get away by hindering his enemies. But God shows uh, to a rebellious King Saul his own sovereignty over this situation. His ability to work with Saul if he's yielded. And uh, the commentators say that Saul is not nude here, but nude can actually mean stripped of his garments, his upper garments, his royal robes, his armor. An unarmed man was said to be naked in those days, though he may have some covering clothes on. If Saul will not humble himself, though, before the Lord, God will find a way to humble him. And God often puts us in a place where it's easy to surrender. And we can be affected by the power of God, but not surrendered to the power of God. Surrendering to the power of God, really, when we lay our life down for him, it really results in a changed life. 
Romans 6.13, the Apostle Paul said, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Romans 6.16, And know ye not <clears throat> that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. And then finally, um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Isn't it sad when somebody says, well, I don't believe that Bible stuff, it's foolishness. Oh, you're in the Bible. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Interesting, cute story to end here. One New Year's Day in the Tournament of Roses parade, there was this beautiful float going by. Remember the parades and the big floats that they had? And it just suddenly sputtered and came to a halt. It was out of gas. The whole parade was held up until someone could get a can of gas. The, amu the amusing thing was this float represented Standard Oil Company. <laughs> With its vast oil resources, its truck ran out of gas. Often, the moral here is and Christians neglect their spiritual maintenance. And though they are clothed with power, according to Luke 24, 49, find themselves out of gas. Remember, Romans 1, 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. We, know, we can know that. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. We represent the Lord, and we don't need to shy away from that. We can be bold to the world because the world is lost. They, they need the Lord so much. There's so much, many people that are uh, confused and lost and don't even know why. It's because they don't have the Spirit of God in them. Let's close in prayer. So, Lord, Lord, uh, let us never to be ashamed to share your truth, Lord, or to share the gospel of Christ. We know that it's the power of God to salvation to all who believe. And if they don't believe, it's the power to send them to everlasting torment. Oh, what an awful thought, Lord. I pray you'd give us a boldness, Lord, when it comes that time to defend you, Lord. I know you need no defense, but you do have us here as eyes and ears and mouth and hands and feet for you, Lord. So when it's time to speak, help us to speak your truth, Lord, that there's no, sh no shame, there's no fear. Lord, we just love you and know that you have been the one who has changed our hearts to, e to be eternally with you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.